Hello everyone, I'm Shannon Piper, Editorial Director for Fire Rescue and FirefighterNation.com. I'd like to welcome you to this webcast, Hidden Hazards Inside of a Vehicle. From seatbelt pretensioners to the addition of airbags throughout the vehicle, new vehicle technology is creating a safer driving experience. But these changes also create new challenges for firefighters. In today's presentation, we'll look at how extrication tools and techniques can adjust to meet new vehicle developments and still ensure responder safety. I'd like, to, I'd like to get us started today by thanking our sponsor, AMCUS Rescue Systems. AMCUS has provided quality rescue equipment to departments around the world for more than 35 years. Their knowledge of the industry enables them to continue to provide rescue equipment departments can rely on. AMCUS continually improves existing products and introduces new innovative tools to make extrication safer, safer, faster, and easier to perform. Visit www.amcus.com to learn more. We certainly appreciate their support. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. About halfway through, and again at the end of this presentation, we'll take a break to answer questions. You can submit a question at any time by typing into the question field. We certainly encourage your questions. If you want to watch the presentation in full screen mode, click on the button that says Enlarge Slides on the bottom left. This will open a new window. Just be sure you don't close the original window with the webcast console. Before the presentation starts, please ensure you have your pop-up blocker turned off. If you don't do this, you might be unable to view parts of the presentation. Finally, the webcast will be archived on firefighternation.com within 48 hours of this live event and you'll be able to see it on that page. Once this webcast has been archived, you can log in as many times as you want, you can share it with your colleagues, and you can download a PDF of the presentation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Mike Smith is a firefighter EMT for the Wixom Fire Department near Detroit. He is also an 18-year veteran of the automotive industry in Detroit and is a senior product designer for Lear Corporation. He has designed and engineered structural steel components interior safety systems, and complete seat structures. Mike operates the extrication-focused website, Boron Extrication, which you can find at http boronextrication.com, where he blends his automotive and fire service experience. He has taught extrication courses in Michigan, Ohio, and California, emphasizing current and emerging vehicle technologies. We're very glad to have Mike here today to share his knowledge. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Shannon. Good afternoon, everybody. Basically, what we're going to be going over today is a bumper-to-bumper -bumper overview of kind of some of the new things, kind of maybe things you're used to seeing, and then some things that are starting to emerge in the market but are not yet uh, very commonplace. So first off, the biggest thing is government crash requirements. They're changing. Um, they're, they're requiring a lot stronger body structures. We all know this. They're using the materials like boron and tailored steel to meet these requirements. But they're also using these steels for the fuel economy because the fuel economy standards, I do believe it's 2016 for the uh, CAF standards, which is close to 40 miles per gallon. The one way they get to that quicker is they reduce the weight of the vehicle. And that's where they start using that lightweight steel. A couple of the crash requirements you guys probably have heard about, biggest one, that's impacted us has been the side impact protection. That one is pretty much completely Im implemented in the auto industry. Those are the big ones where we have strong B pillars and A pillars. And then the roof crush one is pretty well in the market. And that's why you see the roof rails in conjunction with the strong B pillars. The new one that's starting to make waves is the occupant ejection uh, mitigation. That one is going to be an interesting one down the road because that's to keep the occupant and unbelted and sometimes even belted occupant inside the vehicle during a rollover crash. And they do it with uh, airbags and laminated and glazed glass. So take a quick look at the body structures. Th they're changing and it's not anything that we really have to worry about but we do need to be prepared for it. If you look, the B pillar is red in this picture, and this is a uh, 2013 Cadillac ATS. And everyone should now know that if you're rolling up on an accident 
and you've got late model vehicles, there's a great chance that B pillar is going to be boron or some advanced steel, and it's maybe difficult to cut. And I say maybe because depending on your cutters, you could have no problem whatsoever. And it, depending on the age of it, if it's a little older, you may have to do some work and some techniques that we'll talk about a little later. Here's a picture of a A-pillar from a Volvo. And this is an early 90s Volvo. And it's a convertible, which is why you see such a large reinforcement in the A-pillar. Anytime you have a car that is a two-door that offers a convertible option, you're going to have the strong A-pillar because of the crash requirements and the rollover. So that's something you want to always keep in mind. This slide here is of the 2013 Ford Fusion. And what's really interesting about this, this vehicle is if you look at the picture that has the orange and the blue, it doesn't look like our typical B-pillar. It's, it's definitely nothing that we're used to seeing. But believe it or not, it's stronger, it's lighter, and it uses less pieces welded together to make the subassembly of the B-pillar. And they're actually hydroformed steel tubes. And in one part, they actually took away a boron piece that they were using in the previous models. Now this slide is of the tailored blank steel. And if you don't know what a tailored blank is, the biggest thing is it's, it's a piece of steel that has multiple thicknesses in the sheet metal. And they can vary it in several different ways. They can use it when they're welding two different pieces of sheet metal when they're stamping the parts. But the biggest thing to take away from this, you can know all about the tailored blanks and all the fancy names, but if you just look at the picture and look what it's telling you, it's telling you we have thin at the top, thin at the bottom, and then in between where our impact zone would be, we have all these varying thicknesses. And they do that to try to achieve that strength in, in the crash test and stuff. So that's the key to B-pillars, is to assume that they're always going to have different thicknesses, different reinforcements all throughout it. And it'll be an easy way that you can use your tool and your tool placement to see if you stall in one area, maybe you can get through in a different area by just moving a little bit. Airbags. A funny thing about airbags is they used to just be in the steering wheel. I mean, that's, that's commonplace. They've been there forever. We're, we're often deploying those airbags in the junk cars we get to cut up at the uh, junkyard. Usually the, the steering wheel and the front dash are the ones we get. But they've really started to put them everywhere, and I mean everywhere. The front seat, usually you would always see an airbag in a seat on the outboard side. And when you see it on the outboard side, you're thinking that's where it's only going to be. That's the only place that it could be on a seat. But that's changing. This year in the 2013 Chevy Traverse and GMC Acadia, they've actually put a center airbag in, which would be on the inboard side of the seat. That is going to inflate that will keep the front occupants from banging into each other in a crash. So there's something now we have to keep in mind that we could actually have two airbags on that seat. It's just one of those things that we're just going to keep an eye on, be aware that it could exist. So if we have to do some cutting or work around the seat, we know that there could be one there as well. And the cushion. Believe it or not, the cushion of the seat, one of the big things is to keep your, your butt in place. And one of the things automakers try to do is to keep you from anti-submarining, is what they call it, when the person actually goes underneath the seat belt. So what they do is they put in the actual seat structure in the front of the seat on the cushion is they put an anti-submarine ramp. And what that does is it's meant to push the occupant back up against the belt so he won't slide out underneath. So they're actually putting airbags in the seat cushions now. Rear seat airbags, those are starting to be so commonplace that we should just consider almost every vehicle is going to have rear seat airbags. The big thing with those is you can find them in the bolsters, you can find them in the cushions, 
and you can find them in the headrest. And then we've got knee bolster, we got door airbags, roof curtain airbags, and then Ford's even got a couple vehicles out there with the seat airbags. So the front seat airbag, the picture in the upper right is of the GMC Chevy Acadia, the 2013. And you can see that that center airbag on the inboard side of the seat, it's a, it's a fairly large bag compared to what a typical airbag is in the seat. And the picture below it is basically the anti-submarine airbag. And what that does when that inflates is it pushes up that cushion to keep the occupant from sliding underneath. This is something that is very commonplace now, especially in sedan vehicles, is a airbag in the rear seat bolster. What you'll find is in the bolster of the seat will be the actual airbag, the inflator, and all that good stuff there. So it's something to keep in mind on if you're working, trying to pop a door spread in there, that that's usually going to be right around that latch area where we're going after the pin. So that's something you want to keep in mind. It's nothing that I would worry too much about, but like everything you're going to see today, these are things that you want to keep in mind. Here's another example of some of the rear seat airbags. They're coming out of the bolster here, as you can see, and actually the Dodge Dart has them coming out of the cushion. The actual inflator is in the seat cushion in the rear seat. So you can find them in both spots. Now this is the uh, Scion IQ, and believe it or not, this thing is packed full of airbags. It's the one that has the seat cushion uh, airbag for the anti-submarine. It is also the one that has a headrest airbag that inflates around the rear seat headrest. And part of that reason is, is those headrests are basically sitting right on that rear window, as you see commonly in a lot of smaller vehicles. So if you take a look here, in the upper right, you can see that we pulled away the headliner, and you can clearly see the airbag uh, fabric bag itself, and then you can also see the inflator. And it runs horizontal in, in the vehicle there. And then below it, you can see what it looks like when it's inflated. So it's just one of those things that most of us, we're not used to thinking there's going to be an airbag back there, but it's something that we need to be prepared for and always always peel away that trim just in case because you never know where you're going to find an airbag at. Here's the biggest reason why you got to pull trim. If you've ever seen an air airbag inflator cylinder in a place that you might not expect it, this is one of them. This is actually the, um, the Nissan 370Z and it has the airbag inflators actually mounted in the roof. And what's interesting about this is it's a two-seater vehicle, so the chances, you know, of having to do some roof, taking the roof and whatnot, that's something you're going to want to hear about before. Uh, real quick, I see that uh, there's a question about a bolster. And the bolster is basically in the back seat is the part of the seat that is right against the door. It's kind of that fabric that kind of keeps you, when you lean, it's kind of ramped in. And it's basically to keep the rear seat occupant away from that door. It's kind of designed so you can, I wouldn't say, it's designed to keep you uncomfortable to some extent, so you want to sit straight in the vehicle. But it's kind of that, that ramped little area. And if you take a look at a uh, sedan, like a four-door sedan, it's very clearly easy to see the, the seat bolster. Now here's, here's a couple more shots of that Nissan 370Z. And it shows you the, the, the gas inflator. One thing with these stored gas inflators is sometimes they have a long, solid metal tubing that routes to the actual airbag. If they're storing the cylinder away from where they'd normally uh, position it. So if they're trying to run an airbag, say, from the A pillar all the way through to the C pillar, but they're having some package requirements that they place the airbag cylinder, say, right on the A pillar, they could have the steel tubing that directs 
the energy to the airbag. So that's what they did in the case here of the 370Z. A couple airbag precautions here. Airbags are getting huge, and the biggest one is the town and country, the Chrysler minivans. Those run from the A pillar to the D pillar, and they are massive airbags that deploy down. The one thing you want to be sure of is when you're starting to cut those pillars or cut in the roof that you've located your stored gas inflator. And the reason you want to do that is to make sure that you don't accidentally cut into them. Always peel that trim away. But there are times you're going to run into where you see that airbag, the actual fabric of itself, not the airbag inflator, but the fabric of the bag, right where you want to cut. And one thing I, I recommend you do, if it's one of those cuts that's going to make it easier to get the patient out, if you can grab the bag and kind of palpate it like we do, you know, during a trauma assessment, and you can squeeze it where you can push, you can feel your two fingers, then you can cut through that bag. The big thing is, is you want to make sure there's nothing inside of that bag. The Chevy Volt actually wraps the air bag around the inflator cylinder. So you could easily say, hey, there's the air bag. I don't see the inflator, so I'm just going to cut through it and cut through the stored gas inflator. But if you take the time, palpate the bag, and you can rub the bag and feel your fingers, then you can cut through the bag. Seatbelt pretensioners. These are something that have been in place a long time. They progressed. They started as when your parents used to slam on the brakes and it would lock the seatbelt up, to now they are warned by some of the crash sensors and they actually deploy to pull the seatbelt in, you know, anywhere from say four to eight inches. They retract that seatbelt, and one of the biggest things they do is they're trying to stop that anti-submarining and to control the occupant. So seatbelt pretensioners are something that everybody kind of hears about, but they don't really know too much about them. And what seatbelt pretensioners are, the most of them are made of a uh, pyrotechnic pretensioner where they actually, just like the airbags, have a propellant that's ignited, and discharge to move the belt back. But the two common places you're going to find them is you're going to find them attached to the seat. They're usually going to be on the inboard side of the seat, right up against that center console. And you're also going to find them in the B pillar. And when they're in the B pillar, they typically are going to be in that lower part of the B pillar. But there's times you can find them a little higher up in the B pillar, and that's something you're going to want to keep an eye on whiplash protection. We've all known this, that uh, we get on a uh, NVA and there's no, no injuries, no one's complaining of anything, and then all of a sudden we have the one person sitting in the car that their back hurts. And we're going to have to go through the motions, backboarding them, and, and getting them out of the, the vehicle. But with whiplash protection, you want to be careful because this particular whiplash protection system basically uses the inertia from the occupant as he is pushing, as he's driving back in the seat, it's pushing that headrest up to meet his head. So as his head's coming back, he's not going to have as much of a head travel whiplash. But it's something to keep in mind if you happen to be that unlucky guy that has to grab C-spine while everybody else is having fun cutting the car apart. Keep in mind that you want to get your patient to not, you know, move. We tell them all the stuff to look straight ahead and stuff, but we want to keep in mind that these technologies are coming very commonplace, the whiplash protection systems, and this is one, their movement in the seat could push that headrest up, so it's just something we want to be aware of. Key fobs. Believe it or not, these things seem to be more and more commonplace. I know I, I have it on my uh, vehicle that I drive. It's a Ford Edge. And I, I'm a lazy guy, and there's chances that sometimes I just throw it in the center console and forget I put it there. And you could, if I was in a car accident, you'd have trouble finding where that, that key fob is. The interesting thing about key fobs is the range is that the vehicle recognizes them vary greatly from manufacturers. 
Some of them it's just a few feet. Some of them I've heard can be as much as, you know, 10, 20 feet away. And the big thing is, is you want to get that key fob and get it out and get it away from the vehicle. Because with that key fob within the area, basically you can start the car. Now one of the key things is, is just like the push button systems, you know, they have to have the brake on to start the vehicle, but they can actually go in and with, with just the uh, key fob, they can activate the accessory, battery powered, and that's something we want to do is we want to get rid of that power. So it's just one of those things where if you run into a vehicle and you go to grab the key to turn it off and you don't see a key, you're going to see that start stop button. That's a good, good indication you're going to have a key fob and see if you can, you know, get it from the, the occupant, the driver. And that could be one of those things, too, where it's nearly impossible to get the key fob out of the person's pocket based on the crash, the car, and, and stuff we're doing. So in that case, it's one of those things where we're just going to have to continue on, extricate the patient, and do our best with what we've got. Push button transmissions. Now, the Toyota Prius was one of the ones that started us thinking about um, the electronic parking brake. The Lincoln, I do believe it's the MKS here, is one vehicle that ha actually has a push button transmission. And it's really f weird. You look at the center console and you're looking for the transmission shifter and it's not there. So this is one of those things where if you don't see it on the column and you don't see it in the console, this is one of those things where hey, it could be on the uh, right by the radio or the climate control stuff like it is on this, or it could actually even be on the IP. I think the uh, Austin Martin is basically right above the radio and uh, vents on the uh, Austin Martin. So it, those are ones that are out there, and they're starting to you know get out and be more commonplace. All right, Shannon, I'll hand it over to you for some questions. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. That's been, been a great presentation already, and we do have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, before we get to those, I just want to uh, thank AMKIS again for making the presentation possible and bringing it to everyone here. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is take about three or four questions here, and then as a reminder, we, we will be taking more at the end, so please continue to send in your questions. Um, our first question comes from Brian in New York, and he asks, can the seat airbag restrict the lap belts against the occupant's legs, cutting off circulation? No, because just like the other airbags, once they deploy, they're, they're, they're just going to deploy for those quick few milliseconds, and then the bags self-vent, so they're going to vent all that stored gas out. Excellent. Okay. Um, we also had a couple of people, including uh, Donna in Kansas, wh who wanted to know a little bit more about what happens if the saw encounters an inflator. Does, is there an explosion or deployment unexpectedly of the airbag? Kind of walk us through that scenario. One of the big things, and it goes back to the um, Dayton airbag incident, and if you haven't watched that, that's probably your, your biggest thing to look at to see what some of the airbag, the power behind them can do it. But the big thing about stored gas inflators is you're, you're talking some massive PSI that's stored in those, those cylinders. And you never, and everyone that teaches extrication will tell you the same thing, you never, ever want to cut through them. And I don't even recommend cutting through them when you know every single airbag in that car has deployed. You just don't ever want to take that risk because so many things can happen. It can send shrapnel flying, you know, from far, far away, and it could really kill or injure your patient in the vehicle as well as first responders, um, even worse than that patient already is. So never, ever cut the stored gas inflators. Good to know. Um, Ryan in Michigan um, had a question as well. And he asks, is the time in newer vehicles, is the time it takes for the capacitors to discharge after unhooking the battery longer? You know, it, it varies. Some of the new vehicles, you know, can still just be a few seconds, but it could be a few minutes. Uh, there's some vehicles that have larger capacitors, 
it's one of those things where it's all over the spectrum on how long it can take. It's one of those things where you disconnect the battery and you keep that situational awareness and then you go ahead and you start doing your, your extrication. Great. And just one final question before we get back to your presentation. Um, Brian in Colorado um, asked, is the danger with regard to air airbags completely mitigated once the 12 volt, volt power has been disabled? Um, I would say it, that's, that's a tough one to nail down. There's some out there that say you can't backfeed the system to provide energy or power for an airbag to be um, deployed. Um, the biggest thing is, is to shut down your 12 volt and shut down the, the vehicle. And those are the things you're going to do, and then you're going to go about your extrication. You're not going to worry how long it takes. You're going to take your steps you always do that you know are right to make the vehicle as safe as possible, and then you're going to go ahead and move on. If you, if you worry about how long it's going to take or if it possibly could de deploy, it's, it's really something you don't want to do. You want to mitigate the hazard the best you can, which is disconnecting the 12 volt, getting the key out of the ignition, all that kind of stuff, and then go about your extrication. But you've got to keep that situational awareness because those inflators, those are going to be live regardless of disconnecting and how long you've been on there because they're all stored within that, that self that inflator cylinder. So it's just one of those things, disconnect and then keep situational awareness. Great. Good advice. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, thank you to AMKIS for this presentation. And Mike, we'll turn it back over to you. We'll ask some more questions um, at the end of the presentation. So if you do have a question, feel free to submit it. All right. Now laminated glass, that's something we all know about from windshields. We know that when we uh, grab the glass master, punch a little hole in it to start cutting the windshield out or saws off, that's reciprocating saw if that's your, your uh, tool of uh, choice. We do know that the glass stays together. It, it doesn't shatter into those little pieces like tempered glass does. And that's because it's laminated glass. And they do that on the windshield for safety reasons. Well, believe it or not, it's becoming more and more commonplace in vehicles, especially late model vehicles, that you're going to have driver and passenger side laminated or glazed glass. Something you're going to want to keep in mind is once you you can see sometimes on the window they put laminated on there or glazed, right, usually on the lower right-hand corner right by the door handle where they put some, you know, information that's really hard to read and if it's at night, uh, good luck on that. The biggest way you're going to find out is when you grab your window punch and you hit the window, you're going to see that it shatters but it all stays in place. The biggest thing you're going to want to consider here is, is that glass managed? Well, I think the glass is managed. If it's safety glass, the laminated or glazed, and it's meant to keep something inside that vehicle or provide added strength, then that glass is managed. You can go ahead and cut the door, spread the door, pop the door, you know, do what you need to do. But it brings you to the other question is, why is laminated glass used? One of the biggest reasons that you'll find it on luxury vehicles like Mercedes, BMW, cars like that, is it provides noise reduction. It reduces the noise inside of a vehicle. And that's the biggest reason you're going to see it there. Another reason is, believe it or not, we've got that smash and grab where someone throws a rock through the window to grab the purse out of the car. They do it for security and then Lastly, they do it for UV protection. And believe it or not, they say that it's about 50 SPF is what laminated glass can provide. So it's another reason they're doing that. The big thing is, is with, we mentioned earlier about the rollover mitigation and the occupant ejection, the laminated glass is one of the ways they're going to do it. They're going to do it with airbags as well, the side airbags but they're going to rely on laminated side glass. So very well down the, down the road, we could run into vehicles that have each window on the side as laminated or glazed glass. So that's something we're going to have to keep in mind. Could be something that 
keeps us from getting to our patient quickly, but then again, it could be something that manages that glass for us, especially if we have a side resting vehicle where we have to break the glass and we're not able to get in to cover the patient. That could be one way that that glass is managed. A couple unique features, and th these are things that I've ran across, believe it or not, that just kind of make you wonder about what we're going to run into. I mean, we've got weird spots we're finding 12 volt batteries. I mean, it almost seems like there is no place in the vehicle that you won't find one. BMW used to run them in the trunk forever because they wanted to have the perfect weight ratio on their vehicles. Um, but now it seems like they're putting them wherever they can. And it's, it, believe it or not, it's a greater cost because they've got to run that heavy gauge wire back to that uh, 12 volt. And a lot of times they put a remote jumping location underneath the hood when people go to look for the battery. Run flat tires, something else that's in the market. It's not as commonly used, but it's something that could throw us for a loop when it comes to stabilization. Center gravity of electric vehicles. This is something that is something to pay close attention to because the biggest thing is it's changing that center of gravity. The vehicles aren't motor heavy or front heavy like they used to be because the batteries are very heavy and a lot of times you're going to find them in the floor pans, you're going to find them along the tunnel where the volt battery is that runs along the tunnel and then the back seat. So we could have weight in a vehicle that we're not expecting to be in that spot. And then glass roofs. Everybody loves to have a, a glass roof and some of them now are getting to where they are the size of the, the actual roof. It's almost like there's no sheet metal up on the roof. And you can take a look here. This is a uh, Mercedes uh, Benz C-Class. This is a laminated glass roof. As you can clearly see, they got the, the uh, glass master up there. They're cutting, and it's staying basically in one piece. And if you look, they're actually cutting from the front. That whole back is glass, and the whole front is glass. Now, if you take a look at this slide, which is an E-Class, it's basically just st straight up tempered glass. So the minute that broke, it shattered into, you know, a ton of pieces. So that's something that we're going to have to be ready for. We're going to see these glass roofs more and more. And one of the big things you can do is most of them have a shade, a sunshade that you can put on. That's one of those things you you get on scene if you see that it's got a glass roof and the shade's not closed before you shut that, the power off. There's usually a switch right by the moonroof that you can just cover. And you can see on this Mercedes E-Class that that cover, that sun sh uh, shade is covered up right here. And that can also help keep some of that glass from getting into the occupants. And if you also take a look here, you can see that it's a laminated rear glass on this Mercedes as well. How oh, it's all spidered, but it's all staying in place. Now they can even take a tempered glass roof and there's coatings. There's a couple different companies out there that offer these coatings and they use them on side windows as well. And this one is the uh, Mercedes-Benz R-Class and it's with Spall Shield. And basically it's almost like a window tent but it, it's put on at the factory and it will keep all the glass in, in place. But you can clearly see here the sunshade that's off the track, but it's just one of those things that we can use that's already in the vehicle to try to mitigate the hazard of the glass. And then here's a, a piece of the glass roof that's pulled off. It's tempered glass, but it's got that spall shield on it. Now, unconventional 12-volt battery locations. Believe it or not, this is the one that kind of threw me for a loop. My wife has a GMC Acadia and needed to uh, jump it. One of the kids left the battery on. And I, I went and to charge the battery, and I looked underneath the hood, and I couldn't believe that the battery wasn't there. 
you'd think that, you know, that type of vehicle, there's no reason to have it in the trunk or somewhere else. So I had to pull out the manual, and believe it or not, the 12-volt battery is actually in the rear seat in the floor behind the passenger. And you actually have to take a screwdriver. There's a special tool to pull the cover because there's an actual cover over it as well. And you're not going to notice that. You're not going to be looking for that. But those are the things that we have to keep in mind, that these batteries may be in locations that we're not expecting. Here's a good look at the um, Acadia from uh, Moditech's crash recovery system. Basically, it shows that battery right behind that passenger front seat in the floor. And it's just one of those things where batteries are going to be tough to find sometimes. And that's where these systems like crash recovery is something that is awesome that you can grab a screenshot or grab an image by just keying in or selecting a few pieces of information right on your computer. And you can pull up all the hazards in a vehicle. It'll show you where that battery is. And it'll show you where that airbag inflator is. It's just something that can make our job a little easier. Now take a look at this one. This was an uh, interesting one that uh, we found in uh, a class we did in um, Detroit last year. We found the battery was actually in the front fender, right behind the headlight. And you can clearly see it here in the picture, and then the um, crash recovery system screenshot above shows where that battery would be. And based on with the hood op open, you're not going to be able to see this battery. It's one of those things where you got to take the wheel off to get to. So as a first responder, you know, firefighter, rescuer, these are things we're going to pay attention to is when we don't see that battery right away when we pop that hood, especially when we force the hood, you want to keep in mind that it may not be there and you're going to have to maybe look somewhere else. Here's another screenshot from Crash Recovery and it shows the battery underneath the passenger front seat. Now what are the chances that somebody's going to be in that passenger front seat? Pretty good. But believe it or not, I've actually seen batteries, and I do believe it's the Volkswagen, where they put a battery underneath the driver's seat. So how are we going to get to that battery and cut it off? It's one of those things where we're just going to have to take that situational awareness, realize that we can't disconnect the battery, and we're going to have to continue with the extrication and, and take precautions. Stabilization. Run flat tires are where stabilization kind of gets a little interesting because one of my favorite tricks of the trade, I like to call it, is grabbing some chocks, throwing underneath the uh, rocker panels, and deflating the tire by pulling the valve stem. I mean, you can't ask for anything quicker, more gentle. There's not going to be any sudden shift in the vehicle. It's just going to gradually rest down onto the your cribbing. But with run flat tires, one of the problems we have is, is they don't deflate as much as we need. There's times that it's only going to go down, you know, maybe an inch, and it's going to be able to support its own weight and support the weight of the vehicle with no air in it. So that could be something where you pull that valve stem and you think to yourself, why didn't this vehicle go down? I, you know, I heard all the air go out but it's still at the level or very close to it where you started. So it's a couple things you got to keep in mind. One type of tire that's out there is the self-sealing. That's really not going to cause us any problems because it doesn't have a reinforced sidewall. The reinforced sidewall is what enables the tire to hold the weight. That's where the self-supporting one comes into place. That sidewall is a lot thicker and it's made to support the weight of the vehicle. If you see the picture that's got the two cutaway sections with the yellow highlighted, you can clearly see how the bottom one shows that that sidewall is just as thick almost as the tread section of the tire. And that's meant so it can hold the weight of the vehicle. 
And then believe it or not, there are some that have the auxiliary supported. It's something that's not as commonly used, but then it's going to be where you pull the valve stem, it's going to deflate a little bit, and then that's going to be all you're going to get. So it could be a case where you're going to have to grab a wedge or re-crib the vehicle in a different manner. Just something you want to, you know, keep an eye on. Here's another slide that shows the self-supporting versus a conventional tire. The sidewall is meant to hold that weight. Electric vehicle stabilization. Now this is where we're going to keep our stabilization techniques pretty much the same, but where we're going to change them is where the battery is. And the Nissan Leaf's one of those ones that has the battery in the floor pan. It basically takes up that whole entire floor. And that's important to us because when it comes to a side resting vehicle or an overturned vehicle, we're worried about that center of gravity. Where are we going to have to stabilize that vehicle? And then another thing to consider is where are we going to put our struts? If we're going to crib that, we just don't want to try to, you know, jam the uh, strut into the battery. That's something that we're not, not going to want to do. So we've got to take the time to recognize that it's, you know, an electric vehicle. And this is the um, Tesla uh, Model S. And you can see the battery is that whole floor pan. And they actually had to use the strut and grab that rocker panel. And that's the only place they could use to stabilize it. Now, they could have gone, you know, into the wheel well, you know, grab another part of the vehicle. But we always like to grab the rocker or find someplace on the floor pan that's easy that we can get the strut to bite. But that's something we're going to have to keep an eye on with electric vehicles, is we're going to want to make sure we know where the battery is. And when we're putting cribbing in, we're steering clear of them. Tips and techniques. I talked about it earlier about crash recovery system by Moditech. And it's a, a great group of guys that run this. They actually, I don't know how they get all the information into the system, but it, it's, it's a great tool. And this is what you can use it for on scene. You can put it on your uh, PC, on your laptops. You can even get it on your uh, iPad. And basically, on scene, the officer could pull this out with a few selections, narrow down what vehicle it is, and he could immediately know what type of vehicle he's dealing with, where the airbag cylinders are, where the battery is, anything else in the vehicle, if it's you know electric or hybrid, where the cables are. It's just one of those things that can take a lot of the unknowns out of our job in a very quick manner. You take another shot here at the crash recovery. The baby blue are the turquoise colored. You see them in the door beams there. That actually showing you where they're finding ultra high strength, the boron steels in the vehicle. So you can know right away that if you've got a six year old cutter, seven year old cutter, you may be outgunned when it comes to try to cut that B pillar or when you go to cut that A pillar. So it's something that you could keep in mind. And it actually shows you, too, where those stored gas inflators right above the uh, rear door are. And that's just another feature that this system provides to help mitigate the hazards that we face. Cutters. Biggest thing about cutters is you've got to know your tool. Know how much it can cut. Good thing to ask your, uh, your crew is, do you know what? the maximum cutting force of your cutter is. I bet you most of them aren't going to know. They may know what model it is. They, know, know, they may know the make, but they may not know how much it'll cut. And the cutters nowadays, man, they, are, they can cut some, some stuff. 200,000 is not uncommon for cutting force nowadays. And that's something that we need to keep in mind, especially when you start specking out new tools, is what are you going to run into what are your current tools, and then what do you think you're going to need in the future? Now, if you're stuck with tools you have, there's, there's a bunch of ways you can deal with the kind of the advanced deals. One of the biggest things is tool position. And this is one thing I try to preach all the time, is where you're going to put your tool 
and how you're going to cut. Believe it or not, it makes a big difference. Tool position. If you think of your cutter, where is it the strongest? We all know it's going to grab the material and pull it towards the notch because that's where it's strongest. And then we're going to know that our cutter is weakest when those blades are fully open. So if you've got to open your cutter all the way up to grab a huge chunk of a B pillar, you're going to start off in a compromised position because your blades are already at the weakest point. One way you can do it is to change your tool placement. As you see in this picture, he's kind of got the tool, the cutters running horizontal. And that actually provides the cross section of the B pillar where we don't have to open the cutter blades up as much. So by doing that, the tool blades aren't open all the way and we're reducing the weakness. We're kind of playing it, taking away that disadvantage we had and making it an advantage for us. In this position, it kind of shows you how you could grab the B pillar from a perpendicular angle and you're going to have to open those cutters all the way up to grab that. And that's something that you're going to keep in mind, especially if you run into that situation where your cutter stalls and you can't complete a cut. And that's where it goes back to that earlier slide that we talked about that shows the different thicknesses in the B pillars. And you can look and see, well, hey, if I was cutting here in the middle where it's 1.8, if I move my tool up or down, in this case, you'd want to move it up. But if I moved it up a few inches, I may just be in smaller material, thinner material, weaker material. So if you ever run into that situation where your tool doesn't cut and it stalls out, you want to make sure that you give it time to fully load. And when you think it's stalled, you don't stop. Keep that open, that throttle going and you max it out and let it build up that pressure and give it a good 10 seconds before you give up and say, I've been outgunned. But if you're in that case where you're outgunned, that's where you're going to move your, your cutter up or down an inch or two and then try to make that cut again. It's not always going to work, but you're going to run an, into a you know, better advantage than a disadvantage with it. And a couple of special thanks on my end. We got Amkis, appreciate their support in this uh, webcast, getting it out to all you guys. Um, my guys over at uh, Crash Recovery System uh, by Moditech, they are top notch guys. They help me out a lot. Uh, Paul Hasmeyer from First Do Tackle, another great extrication guy out of Ohio. Brock Archer out of California. Jorg Heck, one of the masterminds actually behind Crash Recovery over in uh, the Netherlands. And then Eric Rickenbach in uh, Pennsylvania. So I'll pass it on to you, Shannon, for some questions. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. That was a great presentation. And I think you can see from a lot of the questions coming in that you know, you've got a very engaged audience here as well. So I appreciate everybody um, sending in the questions. Uh, we have time for um, probably three or four, maybe a little bit more. So we'll see where we get to. Um, and our first question comes from Michael in California. He asks, are you a proponent of breaking out all glass as, as a routine or just as situation dictates? Uh, that's an er interesting question. You know, I'll play it. In California, they, they probably have a lot nicer weather than we do here in Michigan. But in the winter, if you take all the glass right away, what are we doing to our patient? We're exposing them to the elements. And in the winter, if we have a trauma patient, one of the biggest things we're fighting is hypothermia. They're, they're going to be hypothermic, chances are, by the time we get them to the hospital. So it's one of those cases where you're going to want to try to use what's best for your patient, what's best for the scenario, and what's best for those techniques you're going to be using. I, I do not like it when you just go around and you break all the glass at once just to get that task checked off the list. But if there's a reason you want to get it all taken out, right away because you're going to make a couple quick cuts and, and pull the roof, then I'm all for that. But you want to make sure it meets the goal of your extrication. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Kathy in Nevada. And she asks, will the laminated glass prevent you from getting your patient out of the vehicle? Will, will it make that process more difficult? Uh, absolutely not. It's basically going to act just like a windshield. And it might even be 
a little bit easier than a windshield. So if it's a case where you, you needed to take that glass out, you could use a Sawzall, you could use a, a glass master. The biggest thing is if it's laminated and you're just popping the door, you can just leave it in place. That's the, the beauty of it. It's just like putting that uh, pack axe smash stuff, the film over it to laminate the glass after the fact. It's one of those things where when it's laminated and you're not worried, you can just pop the door and, you know, get the patient out. Great. Um, Mark in California asks, can you address how you approach auto, auto fires in regards to compressed cylinders? It's one of those things where you just got to be in full PPE, just like any car fire. You know, you're going to want to attach, hit it from the side and keep enough distance like we normally do. When it comes to firefighting, don't change anything that you normally do. The fire you fought, you know, 10 years ago is the same fire we're going to fight today when it comes to vehicle fire. But in that aspect, you also got to consider, too, that chances are once the car starts burning, it's totaled. So you got to remember, are you really saving anything? So you don't want to take any chances at a car fire. Great, thank you. Um, one, one more question here. Um, Joe in Colorado um, asks, are any of the vehicles that have the quote-unquote tough-to-get-to battery locations, are those manufacturers working on providing a more accessible shutdown switch to act as an alternative to cutting the battery cable? I know that's a hot button that Every extrication guy, you know, across the country, and I'd say around the world, would love for the automakers to, to put a button in there just for us that we could hit that disconnects everything. But the, the problem is, is the cost to do that, it's just not in it for them. They, they really have no, you know, momentum. They don't have any value for that. We've come a long way getting them to get these uh, emergency response guides, and a lot of the automakers are being they're really engaged with the uh, extrication community, We're working with us to get stuff out there. You know, it's one of those things where you're probably not going to see it for a long time, but there may be a chance, you know, a decade down the road that there is something like that. But there won't be anything in the near term. No magic button. Nope. Uh, we've had a few questions, too, about seat belts and the way they tighten during a crash, um, how long they stay tightened and how much pressure they exert. The, the pressure they exert, it's, it's, it's going to pull you back. I don't have the exact forces on me, but it's enough to, to tighten that belt. And it, and it doesn't really um, as much pull you back as it tightens the belt and then moves you rearward in the seat. It's more to take the slack out of the seat belt is one of the biggest things. But then they've, they've made it so it goes a little bit further than that and it tightens the belt up. That's probably the, the best way to kind of describe it. But then it's, it's going to stay tight. Following the crash. Correct. Great. OK. Um, one more thing here, Mike. You had mentioned an, uh, an application that you like to use a lot. I think it was the crash recovery system. Um, is, that the, is that the name of it? Um, we had a question about um, what exactly the name is and how they can find that. Um, it's actually uh, Moditech. Uh, M-O-D-I-T-E-C-H, um, and they make the system. It's actually called Crash Recovery Systems. If you just Google Crash Recovery Systems or Moditech, you'll find it, and uh, you'll be amazed with it. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up there, um, and then we'll be sure to, to, to let Mike know about any unanswered questions as well. Um, Mike, do you have any final words? No, I just want to thank everyone for uh, giving me a little bit of this afternoon to help get some more information out. Great. Well, we really appreciate you taking your time to share your knowledge with us as well. And thanks again to everyone who participated today and to AMCIS for their support in making this educational opportunity available to you. If you're attending FDIC, be sure to visit AMCIS in booth 3503. And at the end of, of, of very end of the presentation, you're going to be redirected to the AMCIS training site where you can get a lot of free training DVDs and other resources. So be sure to check that out as well. And please let us know what you thought of the presentation um, as well. And don't forget that this presentation will be archived on firefighternation.com forward slash webcasts within 48 hours so you can share it with your colleagues and download the slides. 
Thank you to Mike, to Amkis, and to everyone for attending. We hope to see you back for another webcast soon.